The epistle lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13, which can be found on pages 163 and 164 in your pew Bibles. Let us together listen for the voice of the Lord. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scripture, we might find hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to Advent. These four weeks, including the four Sundays before Christmas Day and ending with the conclusion of our celebrations on Christmas Eve, signify the beginning of the Christian liturgical year. So, as I said to the children, Happy New Year. Advent is a season marked by the changing of the colors in our sanctuary from the green of ordinary time to the white of Christ the King Sunday to the blue, or perhaps purple in some places, of Advent. It is a special season for Christians of various traditions all around the world. For centuries, people of faith, as well as those unsure of what they believe, are drawn to the customs and practices of the church during the long, bleak days of winter. Maybe it's the majesty of the season that brings them. It may be the deep mystery of it all that intrigues their minds. Or perhaps it's the sights and sounds and music that beckons their hearts. Whatever the reason, literally millions upon millions of people will gather today and in the weeks to come to observe the rites and rituals of this season, of this beginning. The word Advent has its roots in the Latin word Adventus, which means arrival. It can also mean appearance, emergence, dawn, or even birth. So this season of the church is called Advent because it is one of anticipation, of waiting for the day when we commemorate the birth of the promised one, Jesus Christ, and the inbreaking of his presence in our lives, as well as the promise of his return someday. However, from the outside looking in, and even from within, this season can be confusing. And this confusion can lead to serious questions of purpose and often well-deserved accusations and critiques of passivity on the part of the church, those who claim to follow Jesus. Maybe you, too, have found yourself wondering, what exactly are we waiting for? In the gray days and the coming long nights of winter, 
in the bleakness of the news of yet even more deadly violence overseas on our streets, in our stores, schools, nightclubs, and on our campuses, of oppression of those who are often left outside looking in, of those who are robbed of power by systems and structures designed to privilege only the few, of deepening divisions along political lines and ideas around creeds and beliefs between races and ethnicities, of growing expressions of prejudice, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and hatred of all kinds, of selfishness, of anxiety, of fear, of death, and of brokenness. Indeed, what are we waiting for? Are we waiting for some miraculous relief, for comfort, for any hint of life, for any ray of light to break through the bleakness? What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for some kind of sign? Are we waiting for a fulfilled promise? Are we waiting for someone to come and do the work for us? If we're honest, there are times when none of this seems even faintly plausible or remotely possible. And friends, this these days in which we find ourselves, this seems to be one of those times. What, indeed, are we waiting for? And yet, and yet, there remains the echo of a song ringing in our ears. There is a faint image of possibility seen in the periphery of our vision. There's a tender shoot breaking through the frozen ground from the root once thought dead. On occasion, it can even be felt in the steady rhythms of the heartbeat of creation. There's something out there in here Something that compels us forward. This song, this image, this shoot, this rhythm has a name. And it goes by the name of hope. Maybe that's ultimately why we have gathered. We've come seeking hope. Hope in the midst of hardship. Hope in the midst of turmoil. Hope in the midst of chaos. Hope in the midst of loss. Hope in the midst of the bleakness of our days. Yes, maybe that is what we are waiting for. We heard of this hope in the words of the prophet. When the people were facing rumors and threats of war as well as a real, credible possibility of invasion, violence and captivity, Isaiah wrote words of warning, words of promise, words of hope to the people. We heard these familiar words in our first reading this morning, words that have inspired poets and painters alike throughout the ages to attempt to depict the hopeful scene portrayed in Isaiah's words and images. Isaiah writes of a day to come when a tender shoot shall spring up from the line of David, the promised royal eternal lineage, the fulfillment of the promise of God that would bring delight to the people, a symbol of hope. And this will usher in relief for the poor and equity for the downtrodden. It will be a time when the wolf will no longer prey on the lamb, when the calf and the lion shall lie side by side in the meadow, and the cow and the grizzly shall graze in the fields together. Those granted power will no longer seek it, and the powerless will be lifted up, and the earth shall freely bear witness to the knowledge of the one who continues to create the God of promise and hope. Yes, this, this is what we are waiting for, hope. 
But this hope is not discovered in passivity, in a passive waiting for someone to fulfill the promise alone. No, this hope is found in an active, expectant waiting. It is characterized by preparation, practice, and participation. It is one where the people of God see the promise and pursue it. Yes, this waiting, this waiting that we are entering into in this season of Advent is anything but passive, and we are called, even in these bleak days, to play our part in the unfolding drama of Advent. The Apostle Paul writes of what hope looks like in his letter to the church in Rome. In his words we read this morning, he declares... For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Jesus Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. One another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you. This hope, found in Scripture and in the life and witness of Jesus Christ, looks like harmony, unity, and radical welcome. For Paul, this is the call of the church. In the presence of pervasive disharmony and ever-present noise and incessant arguments and mindless shouting across imaginary fences and figurative walls, harmony can seem like an impossibility. But harmony is the way of Christ. Harmony must be the pursuit of the church. This harmony is only possible when one sings or plays their own part with confidence. And together, with all of the voices and instruments Create beautiful music. Individuality does not fade into the background for each one. Each distinct individual is important to the overall composition. Harmony is not a call to monotonous, monochromatic, communal existence. No, harmony is a commitment to living together, honoring the beauty of our diversity. It is in that diversity that the face of the divine can be seen. Harmony is not passive. Harmony takes work. Hope is found in harmony. In a culture that pursues disunity and celebrates division as a way to define loyalties and judge ideological purity, (laughs) unity becomes a countercultural witness to the power of hope. And this unity should not be confused with uniformity. No, demanded uniformity is cult-like. Uniformity requires people to give up their individuality and uniqueness and to sacrifice self on the altar of sameness. Unity, on the other hand, is a commitment to understanding to celebrating the extraordinariness found in each person and perspective and place, and to working together, holding our differences in a sacred trust. Unity protects and preserves particularity. Unity is not passive. It, too, takes work, and hope is found in unity. In a time when groups seem to identify themselves more by who they leave out and exclude rather than by who they include, the radical welcome of Christ serves as a beacon of hope in the midst of this bleakness. And Christ's welcome knows no boundaries. In fact, the welcome of Christ breaks down barriers and builds tables in their place. This kind of welcome, the welcome of Christ, actively seeks inclusion of everyone. 
especially those who are most often ignored, left out, despised, more marginalized, or demonized. This kind of welcome throws caution to the wind and opens the doors wide to all, no matter what. And this welcome is characterized by love. A bold love that sees and celebrates the presence of God in each and every individual and seeks to share the good news of God's boundless acceptance with everyone. This welcome is evidenced in our pursuit of equality, equity, justice, and liberation for all. Welcome is not passive. Welcome takes work. And hope is found in welcome. The mistake the church has so often made has been to sit passively by and offer our hymns and psalms and prayers, waiting for someone to come and to establish the kingdom. The church has waited far too long for the day when the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. Instead of working together to create such a world where the leopard lies down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, where the cow and the bear shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, we've already been shown the way. And we await the full arrival of this day by actively working for the vision that's already been established. This is where hope is found. Hope moves. Friends, in this Advent season, the church must not passively wait for hope to arrive. The church is called to actively pursue it, to participate in its unfolding, to practice it wherever we find ourselves. The church is called to breathe, to labor, to strive, to birth hope into our world. The church is called to be a community of harmony, unity, and radical welcome even when it seems impossible. The church is called to hope. And as James Baldwin once said, the hope of the world lies in what one demands, not of others, but of oneself. And this hope is a dangerous thing, friends. For it is hope that sees a way when the way is narrow and full of shadows. It is hope that demands a different way, a life-giving way, when our neighbors are at risk. It is hope that makes a path where others only see impossibility and impasse. And the good news is we do not seek this hope alone. For the Spirit of the living God empowers us as individuals and as a community to live into hope, to live as if the promises of the divine are already a reality, to be an as-if community in a not-yet world. Hope is a call to action, even as we wait. Hope is all of you, the depth of your faith and your commitments and the beautiful, transformative work of your hearts and your hands. Hope is you. So this morning, maybe the real question isn't, what are we waiting for? Maybe the question is, how are we waiting? This Advent, may our waiting be active, not passive. May we be known as a church and a people who actively live into hope. A people, a church of harmony, unity, and radical welcome, a people, a church of a world that is about to turn. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. To God be the glory. Amen.